That's good. One thing I'd like to point out to you is that many of you are terrified of discovering your real self. But that doesn't make much sense either when you think about it. You see, when you were conceived at that moment, the personality of your real self was quite defined. God had created it and uh, it was perfect in its nature. But it was a little undeveloped soul at that point in time. Someone who was not quite yet self-aware, someone who didn't know itself very well. Now the problem was, as soon as the real self became self-aware, right at that moment it began to receive the projections of the unhealed emotions of its parents, right at that moment. That's why you're scared of your real self, for many of you. Because, because your real self has been receiving unhealed emotional projections from parents and environment from the moment you arrived. And because it happened from the moment you've arrived, you've become afraid of even discovering your real self. Right? And it's a sad thing, really, when you think about it, isn't it? That we're so afraid of this thing that God created. What we need to do with regard to our real self is to have a couple of qualities that we need to focus on and pray about. The first quality is trust in God. You see... A lot of the times we're trying to avoid the discovery of our real self because we don't trust that God created a perfect real self. Can you see that? And so what we finish up doing is we struggle to, to keep away from the real self, to, to reject the real self because we're afraid that the real self somehow is bad. But the only way the real self could be bad is if God was bad. So we're really actually saying at the same time to God that you created something bad and my real self is bad. Can you see that? Like, so we need to stop doing that and have some trust in God that, and in particular have trust in God that God is good. It's an interesting saying, isn't it, God is good? It's in many religions. Yeah. And in fact, used as a term of greeting for some religions. And we forget that God is good and we forget to trust in God. And when we forget to trust in God, a lot of very negative things begin to occur. Because now, who are we left to trust? only ourselves right and that's what that's one of the problems that we face in dealing with our facade our facade is the creation of our self who does not trust in God and trust that God is good so we need to change something there the way to change some of these things is to pray about them firstly pray about coming to accept the truth that God is good and that God can be trusted and God can be trusted to have created you perfect. Right? The second quality that we need to have is faith in God. Now faith is this quality and I've talked about faith before and perhaps if you want a full discussion of, of faith you can get up the faith uh, I think it's relationship with God, faith discussion that was done in Butterham a year or two ago. But we need to, if we, if we have faith, we won't automatically assume something that is negative. 
when we have faith, we automatically assume that the positive thing is the more likely rather than the negative thing. Now, in the, in the sense of in God, if we have faith in God, we, we're going by the assumption, although we don't know for certain, we're, I'm suggesting go by the assumption that God is good and that you can have faith that God created you to handle everything. God created you to handle everything. The emotions that are in you, the emotions that you're worried about that are in you, are the emotions in this area, the damaged self, right? And God was so clever that God created the soul in such a way that no matter how much damage it receives from its environment, it is still capable of clearing away all of those, that damage and becoming pure again. That's pretty amazing creation to do that, isn't it? To actually potentially create the process where a soul could absorb good things or negative things and still end up in this place of being the victor over those things. And that's what God has created. So the damaged self, often we don't have faith in God in our damaged self. We, we only have faith in ourselves and barely any of that, generally. And so what we finished up doing is we finish up trying to create this third person that has no relationship to the first two this facade self the eggshell thinking that that is our way out of this pain that we carry around inside of us but of course it's not the way out of the pain as is evidenced by the life we live and the people we see around us. Right? So if we can just develop those two qualities in relationship to God and start trusting that no matter how bad anything seems inside of us, that God has given us this soul that is capable of releasing it without the soul going crazy and without the soul dying in the process we need to trust that and if we don't trust that we need to pray to gain some trust in that because what I've found personally is that you will be faced with some emotions in the damaged self that are so intense that without that trust and faith in God you personally will not be able to get through the emotion. And in a way, even that is quite a clever creation of God. Because it, what it does is it helps us establish a relationship with God. All right? Through that process. By dealing with these damaged self-emotions, we have to get to the point where at some point we do trust God and at some point we do have faith in God. Every spirit I've ever met in the spirit world, even the spirits that are in the sixth dimension of the spirit world, still have damaged self-emotions inside of them that they have suppressed through the act of love, natural love, coming from themselves. So what they've done is they have not released the damaged self-emotions, but rather distanced themselves from those emotions to the point where they could become loving all the time to other people. But as soon as I start conversing with them about the emotions that still exist within them, very rapidly do they revert back to living in those emotions. So I've seen spirits go from the sixth sphere to the third sphere or of the second sphere just through the course of our discussion, thinking they should, they, and they can get back to the sixth sphere quite easily, but they believe 
that they have dealt with everything on earth that caused their damage but as soon as you start talking about some of the things that have damaged them on earth they immediately start connecting emotionally to those things again so they are yet to be released from themselves and one thing we've got to be careful of doing and this one thing that we are frequently doing is we are frequently creating a facade right that is based around the intellect and this is what every spirit on the natural love path has a tendency to eventually do they eventually get to the point where they use their intellect to suppress to suppress the damaged emotions and they get to a place where they have distanced themselves so far from the damaged emotions that they now believe they are not damaged anymore that's how far you can use your intellect to separate yourself and so I put to you that actually the spirits that are in the sixth dimension are still in facade and one of the greatest facades they're in is the facade that their belief in God is accurate because by definition if they cannot progress any further than the sixth dimension their belief in God must be inaccurate but they believe it to be accurate and so the sixth sphere or the sixth dimensional existence is actually a condition of facade and you can progress personally to the sixth dimension in the spirit world while maintaining a facade is that not an interesting thought <laughs> Natalie thanks I'm a bit confused about that because I thought a third sphere, the third sphere was that you're in a place of truth and the facade isn't truth. Um, I agree that the third sphere is a place of truth but remember when I'm talking about the progression in the spheres I'm talking about it in relation to the divine truth path, the path of divine love majority of the time when I'm referring to all of these things I'm talking about that path what, which is by the way the only one way that's true so when you deal with an emotion truly in the third sphere you will enter a state of emotional truth but that's not the case for a person who's on the natural love path which is not the path that God, dis that God created but rather the path that man created so mankind created the natural love path through their inability to connect with God and as a result of that what applies to the normal way God would expect things to happen even in the spirit world no longer applies to that path because they're using their intellect to create the condition of truth so a natural love spirit in the, in the third sphere will definitely accept the truth every single time intellectually intellectually okay while at the same time emotionally denying the truth that exists within themselves within themselves okay. and that's why when we talk to six fear spirits and we discuss with them the divine love path the majority of them must return to the third dimension to learn how to actually feel the truth rather than intellectualize the truth do you see the difference yes so what has happened in a th say a third sphere spirit he, if he's on the natural love path he'll get to the third sphere and he'll recognize this emotion that I have this damage that I have is the result of the way my mother smacked me all the time when I was little and then he will go down the track of intellectualizing himself away from dealing with the emotion and when I say dealing with it feeling the emotion completely and he will try to be loving to his own mother and try to be loving to any other woman 
Does that make sense? And he'll eventually perfect that and then get into the fourth dimension. When I say perfect it, he's perfected it to the extent that now every single interaction he has with another person is driven by his intellect and understands the truth intellectually, but he still carries around with him the emotion. But the emotion is no longer dictating his action because his intellect is supreme. Okay. You follow me? Yep. Now, think about your own life and how this happens on a day-to-day -day basis. This is happening on a day-to-day -day basis for many of us still. Where we believe that we can intellectualise ourselves through the emotional process. Now, we do this for all sorts of reasons. Many of the reasons which we listed earlier, you know, the feeling that we might be crazy if we go and deal with the emotional way, or this, this today on the earth, I don't know if you've noticed, <laughs> but today on earth, emotions are generally looked down upon unless the emotion is one of anger or rage or fear. No other emotions are really valued. For example, the average person who has a death of a loved one feels a large degree of grief, right? How long are they given to grieve? Often, if it's not over within a week even, people say, oh, they're just not dealing with it well. And how is the definition of dealing with it well? What's that? Where they have a bit of grief, but they're not overcome by it. That's dealing with it well. You see, the way the world is, we have what I would classify as emotional limits placed upon us. This is the negative emotional limit that the normal person must feel. And this is the positive emotional limit that the normal person must feel. Now, while you feel the emotion within these limits, you will be classified as normal and sane. Right? As soon as you feel an emotion that goes, that's far too happy. And that's far too sad. Now you're not considered normal and sane. Now you are crazy and you need medication. <laughs> right? Isn't that not true? Now, if you think about it like that, you'll realise that we only... You, can you see how this creates the facade? We, we are put between this very, very narrow, acceptable limit. Can you see? And while we're put between this narrow, acceptable limit, we now must conform to this limit. Otherwise, there is even the potential that we may be medicated or, or if the emotion gets way, way down there like so, then you get... We have another word for that. Uh, yeah, or committed <laughs> to an institution. All right? So we get medicated or committed. <laughs> yeah, well, that's part of the committed part, generally. But, uh, but can you see how what's happening to us is that as a society, we are basically getting the personalities that God has created this very large, wide variety of personalities and we are shrinking down their potential to what we call normal. And then we are expecting not only ourselves but any other person to live by that definition of normal. Right? So in this society, all you've got to do is go along and listen to a guy who says he's Jesus <laughs> and you will automatically be outside of normal. Is that not true? Yes. All of you generally have experienced that, right? So straight away, you're in the medicated or committed. 
bracket as soon as that happens. And the problem is the guy who's saying he's Jesus might say a lot of sense, but nobody's willing to even listen to that. Because if you say you're Jesus, you're also needing to be <laughs> committed as well. Now, while that might be the case for the average person who says he's Jesus, that's definitely not going to be the case for Jesus saying he's Jesus. But they forget about that, right? So, so any person who says he's Jesus is going to be committed. So, so straight away, can you see that, that the boundaries that are placed around our life, right, are so tight that it's very, very hard to gain the courage to actually go outside of those boundaries. Very hard. Because not only do you have your own inner voice saying to you, but this is crazy, am I crazy, am I crazy? But now you've not only got that happening, but you've now got society, family, and all of the other general constraints that are placed upon you from those particular parts of our society are imposed upon you to such an extent that you've almost got to fight each one, although that's not very helpful either, but you've almost got to fight each one before you can actually get to feel what you really feel. And that's if you wanted to feel what you really feel. <laughs> now, on the opposite side, society has been set up so much that if you do not want to feel what you need to feel in order to progress, in order to get closer to God and in order to be happy, then, or in other words, in order to feel your damaged self, if you don't want to feel it, society is set up to help you do that to the best of your ability. Isn't it? Almost every single construction that we have in our current society is set up in order to deny the individual self and to focus on the collective normality. You think about it. Let's look, about, look at it in politics. How many parties do we have in Australia? None. <laughs> Two primary ones, right? And as Peter said, perhaps they both have very similar beliefs, so maybe none. But you have very little choice when you go to vote. Only one of those two parties potentially is probably going to get into power and you must conform to whatever they say their belief system is at any one point in time, which of course changes, but obviously doesn't change very much because if they change too much, they will be outside of the norms of normal society and so therefore nobody would vote for them. And no person who wants power wants nobody to vote for them. They want everybody to vote for them. So the only way to get everybody to vote for them is to conform to the society's belief of normal. So that, that really inhibits change. Let's look at religion. What's viewed as normal in religion? Well, obviously, it might be a bit wider than what's viewed as normal in politics. However, the whole word cult is about what is normal and what is not normal. Is it not? And any time we see something not normal, we define it as a cult. Do you, do you know, historically, that most of today's accepted world religions were all at one point defined as a cult? That's basically a truth. Because they were all, at the time, outside of what was normal and therefore condemned. And in fact, people died, were murdered as a result of the choices that they made in order to be outside of society at the time. Every single one of today's Christian religions almost faced that fate in, their, in its original inception. And yet, they've not learned because any time a new Christian faith comes into being, they define that one as a cult. Forgetting that they themselves, years earlier, were defined in the same manner, with the same terminology and the same stigma. 
You see, one way that we can prevent anybody from getting into damaged self or even realising their true self is to keep them in the facade self and the way to keep them in the facade self is by giving them a very, very tight set of guidelines by which they must rule, by which their life is governed. And we conform to it voluntarily because if we don't voluntarily conform to it, we are forced into it by society. We're forced into it by family, we're forced into it by government, we're forced into it by religion, we're forced into it by the, by the system that we live in, into conforming if we don't conform. And so what we do is we voluntarily conform because we don't have the courage to do something different. And we don't have the trust in God and the faith in God needed to get beyond that state. So what I'm suggesting to you is that there are a number of qualities that need to be developed in order for you to confront this facade self in the appropriate manner. So let's look at some of these qualities. We've already seen the first couple. One, the first one was trust in God that God is good the second faith in God the third the third is courage without courage and I'm talking the very a very strong personal courage here without courage you will not be able to confront your facade because the world is set up so that you don't confront it. The environment in which you live is set up so that you do not confront it. The spirits in the, that, are, that are oppressing the earth through their earthbound activities desire you not to confront it because they use it in order to have their own desires met. Everyone around you generally is set up to not confront this facade, to have you not confront your own facade. And you're going to need courage to get out of that state and into a place where you really do want to confront your own facade, where you do really want to know the truth about yourself. Another quality... There are, of course, many qualities that are needed, but I just wanted to list a few for you. Another personal quality, which I've already mentioned, which I spell wrong, is integrity, personal integrity. Many of us know that we have addictions. Many of us even know what those addictions are. Do we not? Right? So we know our addictions and we know what our addictions are. But when we have the opportunity to satisfy an addiction, which, by the way, are all created to support the facade, all of your addictions are created to fo- support the facade. Whenever we know we have an addiction which supports our facade, what do we do when we're given the opportunity to satisfy the addiction? Unfortunately, because of our lack of personal integrity, most of the time we choose to satisfy the addiction rather than not. Can you see that? And this is an issue we need to come to terms with. If we had personal integrity, we would go, no, no, I know this is an addiction. And I know that it's not bringing me closer to God. And I know that it's keeping me in my facade. And I know that it's not helping me get into my damaged self. And I know that I'm never going to see my real self while I'm in that state. So I need to have some personal integrity to say to myself, no, I'm not going to have this addiction met anymore. 
and I'm going to feel my feelings about that not getting met anymore, whatever those feelings are that come up as a result. Do you see? You see, if I have the integrity to do that, and by the way, it's not just an integrity to God or an integrity to something else. It's actually an integrity to yourself. Do you want to be your true self at some point in the future? Well, surely we would, wouldn't we? If our true self is created perfect and that's the person we're going to enjoy the most, surely it makes sense that all of us would want to develop a desire to be your true self at some point in the future. Now, if you really want to be your true self at some point in the future, this person, then the facade has to disappear. And if the facade is maintained by my addictions, I am, I am not being honoured honoring myself I am not honoring myself if I engage my addictions in a knowing manner in other words if I know that I have an addiction like for instance let's say I smoke still or whatever that's fine I'm not judging the action but I'm saying if you know you have an addiction and by the way smoking I feel is a minor one in comparison to most of our emotional addictions that we have so if you know you have an addiction, for example, that you badly want approval from a man and you'll do almost anything for it, including going to bed with him if he's the right age, right? Or you badly, want, you badly have a needy emotion towards a woman and you do anything for her in order to get that needy emotion met and you know you have this addiction. If you have the addiction and you decide to go ahead and do it anyway... Can you see you're actually desiring to support the facade? And you have no hope in that state. You have no hope of ever releasing any causal emotion that will get you through your damaged self and you have no hope of ever becoming your true self. Can we have a mic up the back with Alex? Can everyone see what I'm saying there? And yet the majority of us are still taking decisions that we know are a part of our addictions and yet we, we're, we're not considering. We're not considering that all we're doing is supporting a facade to our own self-detriment. We're harming ourselves as much as anyone else. Alex? AJ, um, sometimes I allow myself to go to the addiction to feel how bad I feel. I just like your comment on that. Um, I don't feel there is any need to go into an addiction to feel how bad you feel. You know what would be the more powerful state? Is to actually not feed the addiction and feel how bad you feel. Because you'll definitely feel worse doing that than you will by feeding the addiction. But often I, I find I then can I go into an intellectual space. Yep. Of, um, I'll be specific. I can walk down the street and say, yep. there's a girl over there, uh, I really want a sexual project, but I'm not going to because that's wrong and blah, 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 blah. Yep. But if I just, well, what I did when I was in Sydney was, I actually just said, stuff this, I'm just going down the beach and I spent half a day just openly allowing myself to sexually project. And it really overwhelmed me how... <sighs> what a strong addiction this was for me. Yes, and, and you also thing. damaged your soul and the soul of the girls who you were projecting at. Okay. But I, I felt at the time that it was... A, I guess I almost felt like it was necessary to go there because then I was able to feel the, the emotions beneath that. I understand where you went with it, but what yeah. I'm stating is that you could actually just sit there and feel how much you want to sexually project. Yeah. And that would have taken you to exactly the same emotions without damaging your own soul or the soul of the girls you're projecting at. Yeah, okay. Do you see the difference? Yeah. yeah. See, see, a lot of times we do, we go, oh, damn it, I'm just going to do it anyway. This is something that happens. By the way, can I point out to you that there's been murders because people have gone, oh, damn it, I'm just going to do it anyway. And there's been rapes because people have gone, oh, damn it, I'm just going to do it anyway. And there's been all sorts of violent, abusive and damaging acts perpetrated by people because they just give up or become so frustrated with their own addictions that they decide, oh, I'm just going to go ahead with it anyway, in a justification 
that oh, it's the only way to deal with it. And I'm saying to you that it is not the way to deal with it. You will damage your soul. If you act upon your addictions, you are going to continue to f support the facade and you're going to continue to damage your soul. So while now, Alex, you might have got into some emotions, you also now have the additional hurt that you've created to women and to your own soul to work your way through from a compensatory per perspective. So, so can you really say that it's been beneficial for your soul? Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah, obviously not. Yeah. yeah. So, so the key thing is to go, okay, it's okay to have the feeling, right? When I say it's okay to have the feeling, you're going to have to have the feeling in order to work your way through it. So feel the feeling inside of yourself, how much you want to pervert the women down the beach, for example. And then ask yourself questions about it. Well, what am I getting out of it? What, what does it give me that, that I don't get if I, if I, if I don't do it? What, what, what do I feel? You know, you need to allow yourself to feel the feeling without actually projecting it or, or making the other person feel it. You see, when we sit there and project at the other person, we are now making them feel what's going on. And that is an act that is not loving, which will always damage our own soul and also potentially theirs. So I'm suggesting to you that if, we take, if you take any action you take to the extreme, which is a very interesting way of sorting out whether something is loving. So for example, for, for this thing that you just raised, Alex, like sitting down on the beach and perving at a woman, that seems fairly innocent in comparison what, to what other people do. Most people down the beach, particularly most men, do that anyway. And so there's already a lot of justification that, that we're going to be fine doing that. But if we, if we took that to the extreme of, you know, now, if I felt like murdering, what would I do? Would I go and get involved in a murder in order to feel my feelings about it? If I felt like raping, would I go and rape somebody just so that I can feel my feelings about it? Well, obviously not. So if we wouldn't do that, then why would you do the lesser act in order to connect with the emotion? Can you see? Specifically for that, because it feels lesser. Well, that's the problem, is it feels lesser, but there's still the act of... Uh, unloving act that's perpetrated towards the soul of another and that is going to damage our own soul so my suggestion rather than doing that is to feel the addictions fully to really embrace them emotionally and to feel how they powerfully affect your life and then begin to feel at least what's underneath them like why do I feel like I've got to look at all these women and what do I get out of it and what do I get out of projecting that at them. So it's one thing to look at all these women, but to do it in a real quiet manner where you're just looking at it and checking it out, but, but you're not actually, they wouldn't know you or even see you doing it. And then it's quite another one if I was looking at all these women and I was making sure every one of them felt it. Do, do you see? That's quite another thing, isn't it? Yeah, no, I'm pretty sly, I don't see. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're sly about it, do you, Alex? <laughs> well, I have been anyway. I'm just... <laughs> I think at times it's been an, 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 at yeah. times it's been both, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And there are different emotional reasons for each one. The sly one, there's a different emotional reason to the overt one. And I put to you the overt one is primarily to make the women feel smaller than you, to 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 make the women feel like they're being abused, to make the women feel like they should be scared of you. So that's an act of power over them. The sly one might be different. Do you, know, you see what I'm saying? But the key is to feel it and to feel what you're doing without actually going ahead and doing something about it. Every time you act on an addiction, you further establish your facade, you do not release your damaged self, and you damage your soul further and the, potentially the soul of another further. So that's not appropriate. It's not an appropriate thing to do. But a lot of us do it because we sort of throw our hands up in the air and we go, stuff this, I'm just going to do it anyway. And what would that be called? Isn't that called anger? <laughs> Can you see that? Isn't that called anger? When you do stuff this, I'm going to do it anyway? Isn't that anger? So anger is always letting me know that I'm still in my facade. 
So if we, if we can do that and we can stop focusing on... Can I just clear that up in my, in my defence? Sorry, I don't do the avert one anymore. <laughs> it's all right, Alex. <laughs> no, I just feel publicly shamed. We love you. <laughs> I'm just... It's a good question that you asked and, and very valid for the majority of people because the majority of people think with little things they should be able to get away with this and that but they wouldn't do the same thing with a big thing. There's a very interesting verse in the Bible that says, he that is faithful in least is also faithful in much. So in other words, if we have personal integrity in the smallest of things, we will also have personal integrity in the biggest of things. The world is very different to that. It has personal integrity in the biggest of things sometimes. <laughs> But because of all of the different addictions in play and all the different you know, intellectual arguments in play, it has very little integrity in anything small. That's why the majority of people can do all sorts of things that they get away with. Because they have the attitude that, oh, if I'm going to get away with it, then I'll do it. This is what many of you are afraid of about the potential of earth changes, is it not? That once people have no law, that you're worried, and perhaps you feel you might have a right to be, but you're worried because if, if they have no law, what would they potentially do? You see, a, personal, a person with personal integrity does not need law. Do you get that? They don't need law because they are a law unto themselves in a true sense. They don't need law because it, their impersonal integrity would prevent them from taking an action that's unloving. That's what would happen automatically. We only need law for people who want to break law. <laughs> if we have integrity, we don't want to break law. We don't do things just because we can get away with them. Now, the facade loves doing things and getting away with them. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we going to do about that? Because we, we need to change with that. We need to get to the point where this facade no longer dominates our life. And remember, the world has created or helped create and sustain this facade. So we're going to need some qualities inside of our soul to actually stop the facade from being. And these qualities are essential, those, particularly those four, four qualities. Now, is there any qualities you'd like to add to that list of what you think? Jen, thanks. I have this feeling of being childlike, spontaneous and playful, experimental um, my question is I did want to add that to the list but I would like to ask is that a feeling that childlike feeling a feeling of the damaged self or a feeling of the real self well the, the childlike feeling that you describe will be in the real self however unfortunately because we've been damaged, we can't necessarily respond to every desire that we have like a child would. You look at a lot of ch children nowadays, they have some pretty unloving desires, do they not? And that's a reflection of our unhealed parental unloving desires, actually. Now, so just becoming like a child is not going to help us with regard to some of these qualities. Can you see? Because there are some of the feelings that we have inside of us are actually out of harmony with love, even though they are childlike in their nature. And we need to be able to recognise the difference between a loving feeling and an unloving one. We need to feel all feelings, but not act upon the unloving ones. That's what we need to do. And to do that, we're going to have to have some integrity. Yeah. Can we go up the back to Joy and then down to Natalie? 
Um, you asked, uh, the one I'd like to add to the list for myself is self-love, like love of self, so that I'm not hard on myself and... You wanted to add self-love? Yeah. Yeah, the problem, the problem with adding self-love to the list is that majority of us don't really know how to love ourselves. That's and true. the majority of us do think that meeting our addictions is loving ourselves. Do we not? And I'm saying to you, no, meeting your addictions is not actually love of yourself because it's keeping you away from God and away from your true self. Right? But unfortunately, what we define as self-love is very, very different than God's definition of self-love. If we had God's definition of self-love, there would be no facade. Because we'd actually see it as the creation of ourselves to avoid our true self. And therefore there would be no facade. But for the majority of us, there is a facade. For all of us, pretty much. There is a facade of some kind existing, which tells us that we don't really understand self-love at all. And in fact, saying self-love is going to help us through it is probably pretty unlikely. Because the majority of us are addicted to meeting our emotional addictions. We want to meet our emotional addictions. And we believe that to be an act of self-love. When it's not. So if you were talking about God's definition of self-love, then I would have to agree with you. But it's very, very hard to get God's definition of, of self-love without releasing the emotions of the damaged self. And so while we maintain the facade, we are never going to even understand self-love. Ah, so that's why we don't love ourselves. Exactly. It's exactly why we don't love ourselves. Right. You see, we don't love ourselves because of the emotions of the damaged self. And they are the emotions we're trying to access, but the, the thing is most of us aren't trying to access it because we want to maintain our facade. You follow? And while we're trying to maintain our facade, we're avoiding the emotions of the damaged self. But it's the emotions of the damaged self, once released, that are going to expose to us what self-love really is. So I, I don't think I can add self-love to that list in terms of help to release your facade. Yeah. Um, who was next? Natalie was. Yeah. Um, as a quality, would desire to actually know the truth about yourself? Certainly. And then, um, so desire for truth? And then a loyalty to that truth. But... It, I thought maybe that was integrity. Well, that would be a part of a true desire, wouldn't it? To have a loyalty to it once you've had a desire. The problem, um, I suppose, for many of us is this word, isn't it? Desire. Many of us think we have a desire. But at the same time, our actions prove to us that we don't. You see, one great way to measure whether a true desire exists is to actually examine our actions. So, given the circumstance where I have the opportunity to have an addiction met by somebody else and I take the opportunity, in other words, I get the addiction met by that person, right? Can you say I have a desire for truth in that moment? Now, I might be saying to myself, I want to know the truth. I want to know God's truth. I'm trying to live the divine love path and everything. But it's all just crap. Because our action, our action is telling us that our true prayer, our true desire is that we want our addictions met. That's what our action is telling us. So our action is actually saying that, you know, you know, every time we go into God, please help me get rid of this addiction. And the next time the addiction, you know, usually after you've said, please help me get rid of this addiction, the very next day somebody comes along to meet the addiction, which is actually an answer to your prayer, ironically. You wanted to, you wanted to deal with the addiction. What's the best way to deal with it? Have it come up the next day and see how you go. Isn't that the best way? 
So it comes up, and what do we do? We slip into the satisfaction of the addiction, and God's just saying, yeah, no desire yet. No desire yet. You said, what was your prayer? You wanted the, to, to deal with the addiction. I'm giving you the addiction the very next day to deal with, and you don't want to deal with it. So what was the true prayer? The true prayer is, please meet all my addictions. <laughs> That's the true prayer, isn't it? That's really what we want. And we need to come face to face with what we want. And the way to come face to face with what you want is by looking at your actions. So, when a man does not listen to you, ladies, do you get angry with him? Well, that's because you want your addiction met. He doesn't have to listen to you. And when a woman comes along and uh, doesn't make you feel good about yourself, fellas, like, do you get upset with her? Or do you try harder? Yeah. Well, you just want your addiction met. That's all you want. Does that make sense? That's all you want. So, so our actions tell us how much we want to maintain the facade. But the majority of us, when the situation comes up and I have an opportunity to get loving emotions from a woman and I'm a man, I take the addiction, I take the barter, I take hook, line and sinker as the saying goes, and my actions are proving that I do not have a desire for the truth in that moment. Now, I might have a desire for other truth, but I do not have a desire for that truth at that moment. No? Yeah, just hearing you say that then, so have a desire for truth, but then we would also require humility for the truth we're praying for. Certainly. Humility is essential, but unfortunately for many of us, humility is not very present. Because what is humility? Willingness to feel it, no matter where you are and what you're doing. Right, so it's a passionate <laughs> desire to feel every single emotion. Now, would your facade exist if that was the case? If you had humility fully, would a facade even exist? No. So what we're trying to do is list the things here that will help us get through the facade. Right? And humility is not going to help you because while the facade's there, you're proving you don't have any <laughs> humility or you have a limited quantity of it. Does that make sense? Yep. If we come down to five. <laughs> Um, when Nat spoke about desire for truth, would not a better um, prayer for breaking down the facade be um, a desire for God's truth within your soul? Well, I'm always referring to God's truth, so I'm assuming that that's God's truth that we're talking about there, certainly. Yeah, not, not necessarily our own, although our own is also important. You see, even if our own truth is error, you've at least got to have a desire to know it. So, for example, let's say, let's say my actions are demonstrating that I'm willing to barter sexual feelings for the sake of feeling loved by the other person. Now, if that's what my actions demonstrate, that tells me what my addiction is. Right? Now, if I felt my own truth, I would feel the extent of that addiction. I would actually feel the actual addiction and feel how much it tugs on me and pulls me around the place and causes me to go in directions that are not very loving at times. I'd actually let myself feel how much I'm led by it. Now that's feeling or having a desire to feel my own truth about the issue, which is good. Now I realise that obviously that's not God's truth because at, at one point once you release some damaged self-emotions, you'll no longer feel that tug to go in the direction that's unloving. But you do need to feel the tug to understand that it exists and, and become aware of it. The majority of us are already in judgment of it before we even feel the tug. And so therefore we have no chance of ever getting below the facade. 
Yeah. So both forms of truth is very important. Not just God's, but also our own, a desire to feel it, whatever it is. So if inside of you, Barb, is this rage towards your soulmate, for example. How did you know? How would I know that? So there's this rage towards your soulmate, right? And there's rage towards God about your soulmate and who he is and how he is and how he looks and how he acts and all these different things, you know? And you want God to make you a better one, right? <laughs> Now, the key is to feel all of that emotion while still understanding that God is good and God did create the perfect thing. But you need to still feel the truth of that emotion inside of you. Does that make sense? When you feel the truth of the emotion inside of you, you will get to underneath that, which is the damaged self that creates those angers, that creates the anger towards God and the anger towards your soulmate. Does that make sense? And that's what, and I just thought a personal example would help. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. If we hand it back to um, Rob, thanks. I think uh, honesty should be on the list. Personal honesty, you mean, or? Yeah, personal honesty. Yeah, I feel personal honesty is really important. I feel, though, that uh, it's very much the same as a desire for truth. Like, if you, if you desire truth, you will desire to be honest with all persons in all situations at all times, if you truly desire. And if you had integrity, even when you felt like not being honest, you'd still be honest. Does that make sense? You'd still go ahead and, and be honest. So, so let's say last week you happened to steal something, right? And the person was looking for it and they're going, where's this thing going? I've got no idea where it is. And you're sitting there feeling a bit guilty now because somebody's realised you've stolen something. Right? And you're going, oh, do I own up to it? No, what I might do is just put it back or whatever, you know, like in order to avoid what you've done. And we do this quite frequently in our facade. We attempt to avoid our past actions by trying to correct it without actually live, you know, being honest and truthful about them. So, so what we, if we had a desire for truth, we wouldn't be able to just put it back without saying anything. And if we had personal integrity, we wouldn't be able to do it either. So I feel that those two things create honesty. Yeah. yeah. Do I think so? And then Mary. I feel like, for me, with a, I'd need to develop um, a desire to receive God's love and to know God and develop my relationship with God. Well, I agree, but unfortunately, in our facade, it's very similar to the love issue, that in our facade we often have no desire to receive love from God and every desire to receive love from anybody else other than God. <laughs> right? and, and let's define love. Love isn't the love that God would give us either, but rather it's the addiction being met. And that's what we view as love. You see, when we begin this process of growing our soul, our True longings and desires are barely present. So while I do feel we need to develop this longing for God as our primary thing, the problem with our facade is that it almost prevents it while we're addicted to maintaining it. Yeah. So my feeling is trust and faith are going to have a far greater effect on us than love is because in this moment while we're in our facade we cannot receive love. And that's the sticking point with our progression. You see, what we're doing is we're going, please give me some love, please give me love. I'm not feeling anything. Please give me some love. I'm not feeling anything, right? And then we say, what's wrong with you, God? I'm not feeling anything. <laughs> Don't we? Not understanding that it's because we're in our facade, even in that place, that we're not feeling anything. And we need to break down this facade in order to feel something. And that's, that's the issue we face. There's a very good quote in the Paget Messages that's worth remembering. It says that divine love does not 
open up the soul to receive to help you receive divine love truth opens up your soul and helps you receive divine love that's why it's not love that sets you free but truth that sets you free you see love is the subsequent result of getting into more harmony with more truth and having a longing and passionate desire for God that's sincere but the problem with our facade by nature our facade is completely insincere is it not and in an insincere place how can we expect to receive divine love we have to get into a sincere place to receive divine love now that requires me working through all of the reasons why I'm insincere and it's not God's love that's going to help me do that it's my spirit friends it's my, it's other people who know more about the truth and receive love and it's particularly my willingness to receive truth that's going to do that my desire for truth mm. yep any other ideas as to what you could add to the list to break through the facade uh, thanks Anto it's probably a sub element but desire to grow willing to learn so does yeah yeah I, I, I don't think it's a sub element desire for personal growth You remember some time ago, I think it's one of the DVDs that are new up the back now. Remember I gave that talk about passionately desiring positive change. Remember that talk? That's what th that, the reason why I gave you that talk was about this. Without a passionate desire to change or to grow, it's highly unlikely that we ever will. See, for many of us, we have a passionate desire to have our addiction met. And by the way, a lot of those desires are very passionate, aren't they? Do you find that? Like, you'll go out of your way to have an addiction met. Like, to give you an example, many wake up in the morning with feelings of being very unsettled. Is that not the case for many? No? Feeling of being very unsettled. This feeling of being very unsettled is helped greatly by food and coffee huh? and so what we do is we choose the kind of food that is going to calm us down and make us feel more settled and full and satisfied now in that moment we're satisfying an addiction we need to feel the unsettled feeling that we've woken up with for some reason and go further into it but instead what we finish up doing is we use food to destroy it to, to get rid of that feeling to calm it all down and make it go away now in that moment we are demonstrating our desire for personal growth is very very low <laughs> and in the wrong area we're growing <laughs> but not growing in our soul right so so again another thing to just bear in mind remember I've written this down already actions your actions will demonstrate whether you are really committed to personal growth or not your actions will show you that and this is where you need to look at your actions the more you talk about your emotions with other people without examining your even your reason for doing so demonstrates that you're not willing to look at your actions why would I want to share my emotions with you unless it's for the point of teaching something why would I want to do it for any other reason there has to be some kind of addiction involved for any other reason right? and people go but what about I just need a friend yeah there's one addiction <laughs> you've already got one and it's the biggest person in the universe surely that's enough you don't need another is that not true if you really love you know had this feeling with, with God that's how you'd feel is it not so you've already got the friend you need you don't need anybody else you can live without any friends on the earth and be completely happy that's the reality 
And so my desire to live with friends on the earth is an addiction. Hmm? And while I'm in my addictions, do I really have a desire for personal growth? Do I really have a desire for the truth? Do I have any integrity? Now, I'm not criticising the fact that we don't have these things. But what I'm saying is, if we really want to pray and deal with this facade properly, we need to pray about these qualities. We need to investigate these qualities within ourselves and feel about those qualities. Does that make sense to everyone? Because if we don't feel about those things, we are never going to get to the point of releasing the damaged self and therefore we're never going to finish, finish up receiving divine love or very, free, very rarely are we because it's only the release of some damaged self emotions that's going to allow enough space in us to receive some love. And we're not going to expand as a soul. And we need to, to be happy. You don't want your old shriveled up mess taken along with you for the rest of your ride. Like that mess was created not by God. The mess, you know, I'm talking about the mess that was created from the moment of conception through the absorption of those emotions. We don't need to carry that with us for the rest of our life. We've already carried it with us for a long enough, haven't we? But every time we feed an addiction and don't look at our actions, every time we don't want growth because we think it's too hard, every time we lack personal integrity or lack courage, every time we don't trust God or have faith in God, we're basically saying, I'm going to keep my addiction, thank you very much. And at the same time, we're expecting at some point in the future that we're going to be happy. And that's crazy. How can you ever be happy like that? You've had a whole life up to now with that, meeting addictions. Has it made you happy? So it's not going to make you happy in the future. You know, what's the definition of true crazy? <laughs> Keeping on doing the same thing and expecting a different result, isn't that? And, and how many times do we do that? We keep going for that addiction. Yep, yeah, didn't make me happy. Go for it again, the same one again. <laughs> Oh, it didn't make me happy. Oh, maybe I'm just not going for it as big as I need to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so we go for it in a big way. Right? And then it makes us really unhappy. And we go, boy, I'm so unhappy. <laughs> like, don't know what's going on. Because we're just trying to do the same thing over and again, meet the same addiction, meet the same addiction, not realising that we need to stop the addiction completely and just feel the emotions that are driving this addiction. Now we have a chance to actually get underneath and release and be happy. We have a chance then. So I feel, yeah, desire for personal growth is a very, very important one. Yeah. Any others that you'd like to add? Um, can we go to Graham? Up there? Okay. Oh, sorry, I did say Mary, but sometime, maybe after Graham. Um, would we need um, dedication and perseverance? Yeah, I think those are pretty good qualities, Graham, actually. Um, in, in particular, perseverance, I feel. But dedication and perseverance do seem to go along with each other, don't they? See, what, what happens a lot of the times is we try something once and it doesn't work. And so we stop, right? And when I say we try something once, I don't mean we try the same thing once. I just think we just try something and it doesn't work the way we expected it to work. And so then we stop and we don't stick to something. And, and some have done that, many have done this with the path of divine love, right? In terms of with, with wanting God's love. Is they, they start their longing for God's love. They receive a little bit of it. They feel really good for the next couple of days or so. So there's proof that God actually has love to give and then they long for divine love again feeling like it's the same way and nothing happens and then they sort of go well I don't know maybe God's got an off day today or something right instead of going what's going on inside of myself that is different today compared to the last time I longed for God's love and received it and you can see if you don't persevere or you don't, you know, in, the, in that process, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go, you wouldn't, you wouldn't check the difference. You wouldn't examine the difference of what happened one day versus the other. Obviously, if something has happened once, then it can happen again. 
if it's never happened at all, so some of you feel that you've never received any divine love at all, that's okay. Persevere, it is available to you, but don't keep doing the same thing as you've been doing. So persevere with the desire, but don't persevere with the same actions. Do you see the difference? See, if you persevere with the same actions, you are going to get the same results. And that's not much good for anybody. If you persevere with the desire to eventually receive divine love and have some faith that you will eventually receive it if you deal with different things that are blocking you in your facade, then eventually you will receive divine love. And the moment you receive it, then you'll realize, yeah, I'm, already, I'm now getting to feel some of it. And then you'll start progressing even more rapidly as a result of that. So I do feel perseverance is important, but not the kind of perseverance we would normally think of. It's a perseverance. Uh, how to spell it? Is it A-N-C? With desire for God. Might you also add um, a, a desire to explore and experiment? Would that fit with what you're just saying there? Yeah, I, I agree. Desire to explore and experiment is very, very important. Yeah. Um, perhaps less important than the direct desire to experiment with your relationship with God primarily. Remember I said that if you, get, if you want to get through your damaged self, at some point in the future, you are going to have to have God in the picture. So if, remember earlier too I said that if you put God as your number one priority and then the other things that you're investigating, then that will assist you to get to that place. So what I'm suggesting is if you firstly have perseverance with, with your desire to connect to God, then that will help you get a perseverance to, to, to well, it will help you get to the place where you also desire to experience other things. Yeah. Your real self is, an, is automatically an experimental being. It's a part of every one of your natures, believe it or not. Right? It's automatically an experimental being. Your true self wants to experiment. Now, you think about it in your childhood, it was shut down incredibly, was it not? This idea of experimenting. See, in your childhood, you learned that you had to get it right the first time. If you didn't get it right the first time, then you would be punished in some way, usually emotionally, but oftentimes emotionally and violently. You would be punished for getting it wrong if you experiment. Right? And so what we learned to do was to only experiment with everything that we were certain that we would achieve. And that's not true experimentation anyway. Now that is, a, a, true experimentation is a part of our soul. Um, have I, can I just move this out of the light a bit so it's not so bright? And I probably need to move myself out of the light a bit. Do I too? Um, I'm right. Yeah, okay. So, so yes, I feel perseverance in particular is really, really important. But in particular, desire for God. And there's another reason why that's the case, and that is that if you don't desire God firstly, sooner or later, one of your addictions will maintain a facade in some area of your life. So, for example, if you desire your relationship more than you desire God, then all the facades connected to the relationship will continue because they're not going to get confronted. And the reason why is because your relationship with your partner is more important than your relationship with God. And while your relationship with your partner is more important than your relationship with God, it's now going to be your partner-based emotions that dictate what happens to your progression. And if you're in a facade with them, you will maintain the facade. But with God, if you have God first... It's impossible to maintain a facade and at the same time maintain a relationship with God permanently. It's totally impossible. We can only maintain a temporary relationship with God while 
we have our desire for God stronger than anything else and our desire for God pa passionate and in, in sincerity <coughs> in true sincerity <coughs> while that is the case God's there now anything that comes along I'll have no trouble um, dealing with and dealing with the facade of and getting into the emotion of at some point Yep, I've just got to have a drink. <coughs> Any other? Mary. Um, so for me, uh, and I'm, because I feel like I'm really facing off with my facade at the moment, there was three things that I thought of. Um, a willingness to feel out of control because my facade is the thing that makes me feel most in control. <laughs> That's my addiction in my facade. Yeah. Uh, so a willingness to feel out of control. A willingness to um, relinquish self-judgment mm -hmm. because that's another thing that keeps my uh, facade in place. I believe that my facade is the thing that will get the love and if, I'm, if I acknowledge my damaged self then I risk judgment. Uh, and my own and other people's and that relates to the third thing which for me uh, I don't know if it's for everyone is about a willingness to experience the emotion of humiliation um, so because I'm so invested in uh, the facade being the thing that is safe and presentable and lovable uh, unless I'm willing to experience this feeling of humiliation then I'm going to remain in facade so my question back I agree yes. with all those yep. things but my question back would be, what is going to help you have a willingness to feel humiliated? Well, I guess that's where my action... Uh, good question. Let me just... See, what I'm listing here is sort of the layer above that, or the layer that's the foundation of that. So, so all the things that Mary's just mentioned, willingness to be out of control, willingness to be humiliated, and what was the third? Judgment, let go w of judgment. Willingness to let go of judgment. They are all essential parts of you letting go of your facade. But what's going to drive you to do that? Well, may maybe it's what you've already said, trusting God and faith. And that was my original question. But for me, I feel like I've spent three years... <laughs> talking about having a trust in God and a faith in God and as you said before it was all crap because I didn't want to feel humiliated I didn't want to feel uh, I didn't want I didn't want to give up judgment and I certainly we well, also didn't, didn't have a desire for emotional for truth. truth and the, uh, the only thing that has brought me in the last couple of weeks completely face to face with my facade is that I changed my prayer to a heartfelt desire for truth yeah. and within 12 hours my world fell apart so yeah. <laughs> it works yeah and all you had in that case was just that one thing wasn't it in that one thing it, just a desire for truth yeah. yeah well i feel like perhaps the other things um you had to have some courage yeah you wanted some courage but at that stage, I you, had didn't, no integrity. you didn't have any integrity. That's that how that my world fell yeah. apart. I realised I have no integrity. You yeah. didn't have much faith in God? No. Well, no. No. You didn't have much desire for personal growth? No. I, I said I did. I said I had trust, faith, uh, desire for personal growth. But you definitely had per per perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> dogged, <laughs> dogged, ridiculous perseverance because you can't get anywhere unless you want truth. And I didn't want truth, so I was persevering. Persevering, persevering, but <laughs> yeah. saying, no truth, no truth, no truth. Persevere, persevere, no truth, persevere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it was disaster. I truth. suppose what I'm writing here is what, a, what I feel to be the foundation of what you need to start with if you want to really deal with your facade. The things that Mary mentioned are essential but they are above the foundation, if you like. Because without some of these things, dealing with those things is never going to happen. Never going to happen. Right. So, so I feel what we want to put in this list here is the things that are essential for us to deal with things as a foundation of our release of our facade. The foundation of that. If we go to Linda, it's just... AJ, one of the things that I'm really struggling with is, is the issue of trusting God. Yep. 
How is it when I've had experiences where God has been there yeah. and yet I find it so hard? Yeah. One of the main problems we have as individuals on the planet is we don't trust our own experiences enough. We sort of go into this place where um, we have an experience, but we don't add the experiences together. It's quite strange in a way. Like, if I can give you an illustration of it. Let's say, let's say one spirit came and talked to you and you heard them. You go, oh, wow, it's the first time I've ever heard a spirit. And you might start chatting back and you hear a bit of a conversation. And then they go away. And then it didn't happen ever again. What would happen? What would begin to happen? Yeah. You'd start doubting, wouldn't you? Maybe it wasn't a spirit. Maybe there's something. Maybe, I don't know, what's going on? Was it a spirit? Was it not? Then you ask other people, do you think that was a spirit? And of course, they weren't involved in the interaction. So the likelihood of them knowing whether it was a spirit or not is less than you. Right? But anyway, we hope anyway that they'll come up with some magic solution and so we ask them and we try to find out. Now that was one experience. And one experience, if we just add, add one experience down, there is you know, potential to doubt that experience, isn't there? Yeah. But then we have a second experience. Right? And this experience is another spirit comes along and we have another conversation, maybe a week later. We go, wow, second experience. And, and then we start having a series of experience, you know, like one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Eventually it adds up to like we have a hundred of them, let's say. So we have a hundred of them. Now what's the likelihood of you doubting that you're talking to spirits? Isn't it lower than the likelihood was of you doubting before? If you add up all of the experiences together, what it does is it has a cumulative effect on your soul of providing evidentiary proof that something is real. Do you get that? Okay. Now, this is the same issue we have with trusting God. You see, what we often do is we have the experience, number one, and we have number two experience where it's obvious that God was leading us and our guys were helping us, and we have another experience where it is, and we have another experience. But all we see them as is ones. Does that make sense? We just see them as one experience, one, one experience each one of them individually. We, we don't accumulate them, accumulate them in terms of the evidence that they're providing to our soul. Do you follow? This is what's happening for yourself. You're not allowing the evidence to accumulate. You're looking at them all as individual issues and therefore you still feel the same as you did as you did in the first issue. Does that, does that make sense, Linda, to you? Yeah. Now, the question we've then got to ask ourselves is why don't we want to accumulate them? Why don't we want to add them all together? And you know there's only one answer for that. And you know what that answer is? This fella. Fear. You are afraid to trust in God. Do you understand? Yeah, You've had plenty of experiences that could cause you to trust God. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense, this can I, fear. So can I explain to you what the cause of the real cause of the fear is? It has nothing to do with trusting God. What do you reckon it might have something to do with? Trusting Not trusting myself. What is the main reason why you don't trust somebody? You think about it in your day-to-day -day life. From an emotional perspective, when don't you trust somebody? The majority of times, what has been the triggering event that caused you to not trust somebody you previously trusted? Ah. You know, it's much simpler than what you're all thinking. 
Can I say what it is? Because other people tell you not to. And you believe them. Let me put to you in a different way. If I've had heaps and heaps of experience of trusting God and I'm yet to trust God, then there must be something else I'm afraid of. The only other thing that I'd be afraid of is other people, isn't it? So I must be afraid of other people's opinions in some way. Now, now why would trusting God make me afraid of other people? You think about that. Can you see that it's because when I trust in God and I fully embrace my relationship with God, I might finish up losing other people in my life. I might finish up losing my current situation in some way. I might decide to leave my current home and leave my current life and leave my current safety and security all of which I have heavy addictions into. Do you understand? When we've had hundreds of experiences that we can trust in God and proof in that manner that we can, and yet we still don't trust in God, it's got nothing to do with God. It's got everything to do with how great our fear is in com of, of other people in comparison to God and what other people think we should be doing with our life in comparison to God. Now, if you think of your personal circumstances, you can see what I'm speaking of, yes? You can see that if you do fully embrace your relationship with God and you do fully feel what you feel in that relationship and you do fully embrace the actions that you desire to take, that there are going to be people in your life that are confronted. There already are. And you're afraid of the results of that. Do you follow? Yeah. So you would rather say, I have all these experiences and yet I don't trust in God, than you would say, I've had all these experiences with God, but I'm terrified that if I act upon them, that my life will fall apart. And I guess that's a bit of what I'm doing at the moment is challenging that Good. by taking a three-week sabbatical <laughs> <laughs> of learning to be self-responsible and God-reliant and really facing head-on the addiction that I have with John yep. and, and expecting him to rescue me. Yep. And, and this is inter it's an interesting thing that a lot of people do do. It's, th the problem is, is that we often have plenty of evidence that we should trust God and we have pl plenty of evidence that we need to have faith in God and we can have faith in God. The problem is, is we also have plenty of evidence that people around us will get into a potential rage, a potential you know, destruction of our own life may occur through the hands of others and I'm not saying John's like that because I don't feel he is but uh, I feel you're afraid of that um, certainly it's more afraid of my father I think and his exactly yeah. exactly it always gets back to the real persons you're afraid of have to do with what's unhealed in the childhood so the real persons you're afraid of is your mum and dad and what they will think and what they will feel about all of this. And that's what often guides our action. And so we then go, oh, I can't trust God, I can't trust God, but it's all a furphy. It's all just a distraction from the truth, which is I can trust God, but I don't want to do what, God's, what, what God seems to be leading me into because all these other people will be really upset with me. See, the other emotion that's really coming up a lot in this past week is the how deep the fear of judgment is. Yeah. You see, it's our investment. Remember this facade, and it's very important to understand this about the facade. Our facade is all about our investment. In our own or others opinion opinion wait ahead of myself opinion of myself can you see that 
So, so the only way really to get through that is just to keep challenging it, isn't it? To keep facing it head on and to keep feeling it. Yeah, start challenging your own opinion of yourself, like both in a positive and negative direction. You know, most, many of us have a far higher opinion of ourselves than we deserve. And many of us also have a far lower opinion of ourselves than we deserve. And often we have a mixture of the two on different subjects. Does that make sense? And then we are also heavily invested in other people's opinion of us. We're decimated by somebody just saying, you're no good. Decimated internally. Like, do you feel you're ever going to be decimated like that if you're at one with God? Obviously not. Right? The fact that we're decimated indicates our investment in the facade. Right? It's, it's something that indicates to us that we want desperately other people's good opinion of us, that we're willing to do and barter almost anything to gain it. That's what maintains this facade. Yeah. And we need to allow ourselves to feel our fear about that. There's fear that guides a lot of those actions and decisions that we make. And we need to allow ourselves to feel the fear that we have in even just disappointing one other person. You know, if somebody comes along and said, I'm really disappointed in you, for the majority of us would be decimated by that. It would affect us for weeks, many of us. Of course, the higher the opinion of the person you have, the worse the effect. So if someone of a very low opinion of you comes to you and you have a, sorry, have a low opinion of them and they come to you and say, I'm disappointed in you, go, oh yeah, no worries. But if your mother or father come along and say, I'm really disappointed in you, it's like, ugh. Isn't it? And this is where our facade begins. We try to be what they want us to be in order to not be ourselves because they don't want to know ourselves. And so we then start growing and, change and wanting to not know ourselves either. That's our end result. My suggestion is look at your investment in your own opinion of yourself and also look at your investment in other people's opinion of you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you do that, the more you will have some desire for truth. If you can release the emotional investments in others and what they might potentially do. The, the, the irony is, if you release the emotions, it's highly unlikely that the other people will do what you think they're going to do. <laughs> Highly unlikely. However, if you hold on to the emotions, it's highly likely they're going to do exactly what you think they're going to do. <laughs> and there we are, we're sitting there justifying holding on to the emotions, thinking it's safer. But it, we're just creating an event that's highly likely to occur because of the fear that we have. It's ironic, but we often do this. Yeah. Does that make sense in terms of your trust in God, though? Good. Joy, right up the back. And then we'll come down the front. And on this side, because you just, yeah, Pierre, because you just bring your mic down there. That'd be good. Joy, thanks. Oh, AJ, did you just want a reminder about the fear of whether I'll be loved? The, did you just want a reminder about the fear of whether I will be loved? Um, How's that I, fit in? You, yep, yep. Um, I feel that you're always going to fear that until you get con in contact with your damaged self. There are some emotions that you're always going to have until the damaged self emotions are released. The reality is for the majority of us, we were never loved, really. And you have a right to be afraid of it on the planet because the reality is that very few of us have ever loved on the planet. However, we can release the emotion by just allowing the fear to be present. Right? So I feel that with regard to this issue of love and our fear of never being loved, it does not have to guide us in dealing with our facade. Like it doesn't have to change how we deal with our facade. If we just, for example, if we just come to terms with the fact that we haven't been loved by anybody, <laughs> then we'd already feel the fear of never being loved. Does that make sense, Joy? 
Yeah? And so uh, what I suggest is that uh, one of the things I had to come to terms with, now I had to come to terms with in a really like harsh manner in, the rea in reality in my own life where, where not a single person in my life who was previously in my life would speak to me, not a per person would visit me and I was totally alone. My, my own children wouldn't visit me or see me or allow me to see them. And, and my parents wouldn't do so either. Everyone who was close to me in my life, all the friends that I had, none of them would speak to me. And so I was actually totally alone. And then I came to terms with the fact that I wasn't loved. <laughs> now I suggest to you that you don't have to go through all of that. You, you instead just need to feel that you weren't loved. But, but I refused to feel it until I was in this situation completely by myself and completely in my own life, no, no, nobody, nobody around me, realising that if I died, that three months later they'd find me because the rental would be due and had come around looking for why it wasn't paid and I realized that nobody would come to my funeral not a single person and I had to get to that stage to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't loved and ironically it helped me a lot because I grieved all through that like of how much I wasn't loved and I come out the other side of that does that make sense we don't have to go that far, but some of you may, <laughs> where you create that in your own life to actually feel that emotion. But um, my feelings are you don't have to go that far. All you do is need to come, to come to the truth, and that is that in our childhood we were never loved. Right? Now, many of you are loved now from somebody else, but many of you were not loved in your childhood, and that's the reality of that emotion. Yeah. Who was next? I think it was the girls down the front. Who was it? Oh, sorry, it was no. So it was over there. We're going to go there first. Okay. Sorry, you've had your hand up here, actually. <laughs> Thank right. you, AJ. I'm wondering, would strength of will go on this list? And why I'm asking is because I finally realised that in my damaged self, my will was so squashed as a child. And but for me to be able to discover and develop some courage, I've had to activate my will. I agree that it is essential. It's, it, your will, unfortunately, though, is not going to... Your, your pure, passionate desire is not going to be present until some of the damaged self is released. But I do feel that your will... Remember, I wrote that up earlier. Mm. Is, ..is an essential part of working the way through a facade. But you've got to be honest about your will. Most of us are not working through our facade, but living on our addictions. We're using our will to still get our addictions met. And that's... So we can use our will in the wrong direction, and it won't help us at all. So it could be very self-reliant yes. rather than God-reliant. So what we need to do is use our will in a different direction rather than in this direction of fulfilling our addictions, you see. So it's a will to discover the truth, the desire to discover the truth about ourselves and using our will in that direction rather than using our will just to get our addiction satisfied and met. Mm. Yeah. Um, sometimes I felt the spirits around me almost wanting to close me down and when <coughs> I've actually remembered my will then things seem to shift. Very much so, yeah, okay. yeah, very much so. Um, and you're, you know, what's helped you there is recognising that spirits are influencing your will and that's, again, part of the desire for truth, you know, wanting that. So the, your free will is the most incredible gift that God has given you besides her love. Your free will is the most incredible gift. It, 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 and, and it's not dependent upon God's love in the sense that you, you can exercise it out of harmony with God's love if you wish. 
God created the ability in you to do that. And for that reason, it's, it's one of the most powerful gifts you can ever receive that you've already received without asking for. Whereas, desire for, whereas God's love cannot be received without asking for it. Your will and the power to have your own will was given to you as a gift without even asking for it. Mm. Yeah. Many of you feel that it's a wrong decision God made. <laughs> right? Because you feel like, why did God give me free will? Why didn't God do this? And why didn't God do that? Why does God give other people free will? Because then they can hurt me. And there's all these other questions that we have. But the reality is this gift of free will that every single human has had bestowed upon them is a very important gift. Mm. Yep. And it's essential to use that will in the right direction. So it's not just an issue of will, it's the issue of where you use it, you know, what decisions you make as a result of it. So would that definitely belong in the real self? Yes. You, you, want to, you want to, basically it's desire for truth, desire for personal growth and those kind of desires which will help you exercise your will in the right direction. All of this is about your will, in fact. This is all about your courage, integrity, desires. These are all part of your free will yep, mm -hmm. and how you exercise it. Thank you. Yep. If we come over to Renee. I just feel um, sin sincerity is on, would be one on the list yeah the problem is when we start uh, I feel this is where integrity comes in we need to know when we're being insincere we're not going to have true sincerity right from the beginning because it's impossible to have true sincerity right from the beginning when we're damaged true sincerity is only going to come over time over the release of different emotions we'll get more and more true sincerity so what's going to govern us releasing those emotions it's only our will exercising in the right direction and desire for truth and desire for growth that's going to do that so i feel that while those things are important it's not going to get you through your facade yeah thank you um I feel gentleness or compassion or tenderness, but not as an avoidance, but... I understand where you're coming from, yeah. I tend to be harsh and judge the mistakes. The problem, again, is that usually that doesn't happen until we start releasing some of the damaged self. Like, I, I know that it's taken me years to have some compassion for myself. And right at the beginning of my process, I had no compassion for myself <laughs> at all. And, and part of the facade was to not have compassion for myself because it was treated by, by family and others that having compassion for yourself was letting yourself off the hook. So, so it was treated in such a manner that, that I couldn't have compassion for myself. Compassion for yourself is really important, but I don't know if it's going to get you through your facade. Compassion for your damage will definitely get you through your facade. So in other words, like Mary said, you know, not having a judgment of the damaged self, no matter how bad it is, how bad it looks. You know, for many of you don't realise yet, and from our discussion tomorrow, you might have more of a realisation, but how, how damaged our souls actually are at times. And we need to have some compassion for that. And, and not huge amounts of judgment and anger towards ourselves. It's the same as the emotion of um, self-punishment. That's not a good emotion to retain. If you have some compassion for yourself, then you won't have self-punishment. But, but it's very hard to have that right at the beginning because the damaged self was taught to punish itself by our parents. So unless you, until you release some of those emotions, you won't actually get over that. And the problem is when you're in your facade, you haven't yet released those emotions. So you can intellectually try to have some compassion, but it's going to be very hard to have true compassion until you've released some of those emotions. Yeah. Um. Hi, Jay. Um, I would like you to talk a little bit more about what the will is. Because as I grew up, I like. Can I save that for another talk? Because it's a big, it's it's the primary gift that you've been given, and it deserves more than a five-minute discussion. Um, to me, it deserves a series of talks. <laughs> um, it's such an important part of what God has given you as a gift, your free will. But but it's also very important that you learn how to use it harmonious with love. 
And the majority of people in the spirit world in particular um, do honour the, the sense of free will they have, but often are using it out of harmony with love, not understanding the damage that you can do with your will. So our will exercised in a negative direction can do huge amounts of damage. And so for, for this reason, the, our will exercised to support our facade can do huge amounts of damage not only to ourselves but also many souls around us. This is where people like, um, you know, people that many of you might have condemned in the past like Hitler, Stalin, those kind of, those kind of people, world rulers who have done lots of destruction, they have been living in their facade and exercising their will in that direction. And you can do tremendous amounts of damage uh, in that regard. So, what I would, so rather than talk about will now, I'd rather talk about it in terms of exercising in a positive direction and the effects it has, and exercising it in a negative direction and the effects that it has. Yeah, and also like what it is, because I, you know, like um, I heard I was weak-willed. Right, okay. So yeah. when you, and it's almost, for me, it's almost like an internal slave driver. So when you talk about the will, <laughs> I just want to turn Well, see, I, I would say weak willed was, the indication was there, has, there was a lack of courage. To me, that's a part of will, but it's not the only thing to do with will, free will. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, if you're, often if you're accused of being weak willed, it's actually, you're actually being accused of having a lack of courage, right? It was more like, you know, not finishing things, not wanting to do things and... Yeah, well, that's the only way, reason why yeah. you would not finish things, yeah. isn't it? Because you don't want to follow through. Like, to me, to me, that's not a will problem. That's a fear problem. Yeah, so, you know, I'm happy to wait for another talk, but I would like to... A bit of a definition of what the will is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. To me, what you've just indicated is a fear problem, though, not a will problem. Unfortunately, the majority of us think, you know, when we say things like weak will, not have direction, and all those kind of things, a lot of that is all about fears. It's not about will at all. The, re the reality is in our real self, there is a very strong will and desire. In fact, in fact, God's given us that as a part of our, uh, our entire existence. We are never going to lose our own ability to make our own choices and decisions because it's a gift God's given us right from the beginning. The issue you face is you start some jobs and don't finish them. That's not about will or the definition of free will. That's about desire and fear, which are totally different parts of will. Mm. I just wanted to say there's a really cool movie about Will that I watched with Tris, and it's called The Green Lantern. The Green Lantern? Yeah, yeah. and Will is green. <coughs> Sorry? Will is like, it, Will it's is green. all about Will. Yeah. It's really yep. neat. Yep. Yeah, The Green Lantern. <coughs> I'm running out of steam, so I'm going to have to stop soon. Um, I was just thinking about repentance with that. Yeah, unfortunately, in our facade, we're not very hot on repentance. Okay. You know, in our facade, we don't want to be humble. We're not hot on repentance. You know, we view repentance as a bit of a thing you know, for other people to do when they've damaged us. <laughs> but we don't really have much of a longing for that. And, and the reality is, it's only when we start getting down into this damaged self that we start actually having a lot of these emotions that you're starting to talk about now. I feel that these sort of are the foundation of getting through the facade. Once you get through the facade, you're going to have lots of other emotions to feel, but they'll be relatively easy in comparison to feel because you've learnt to have these as a foundation cornerstone of your progression. This foundation is important. Without the foundation, you'll have some very hard issues to deal with in the future and you'll give up without the foundation. But if you get these, these desires and abilities and these qualities inside of yourself, it doesn't matter how hard things get, it doesn't matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter who comes up or where they come up, whether you arrive in the spirit world or you do it here, makes no difference. You will still get to your real self and you'll still get to God. 
if you don't have these qualities, sooner or later one of those qualities or the lack of it will be exposed. Yeah. And for many of you, it's been exposed quite rapidly at the moment, day after day for some of you, it's being exposed, the, the lack of some of these qualities. The key is to go, okay, this is telling me again that I don't have integrity. You see, what we do, a lot of us, is we go, oh no, it's telling me that the other person should do the right thing by me. Instead of going, well, where's my part in this? Where's my lack of integrity? Or my lack of courage? Or my lack of desire for truth? Or my lack of growing? Or, you know, what's going on for me? If you get these qualities and develop them within yourself, what will happen is you'll get rapidly through the facade and to be honest, it's possible to get through the facade in a matter of weeks. Right? And actually into damaged self emotions. Right? That's the reality. But if you don't have some of these color these qualities and some of these qualities are missing in you, it'll take you years to get through your facade. There's people in the spirit world that have been doing it for a thousand years, two thousand years, five thousand years, still not through their facade. Like I have friends from the first century who are still in the hells, not through their facade. They're still yelling and screaming at me about what I did to them and holding on to their facade. Right? The reality is when you're in this place, you can blame everybody around you and not look at yourself. So what I've hopefully done today is just help with this whole, quality, this whole issue of the real self. Like the facade self, the damaged self and the real self are all a part of us right at this point in time. The key for us to do is to get through each layer and we need some qualities. These qualities will be necessary for us to get through the facade layer. What we're going to do in the future is talk about some of the other layers, the, the damaged layer and the real self. But we'll talk about what you're going to need to get through the damaged layer. Does that make sense? Different set of qualities. But these qualities are essential for you to invest in. I often uh, gave an illustration in the first century about your investments. And uh, one of the illustrations was uh, of a man who was a farmer and a landowner and he, he just kept building bigger and better things. Bigger storehouses, bigger property, he'd store all the stuff in it, saving up for his future. Right? And when he died, None of those things went with him. And he was left with one investment. The investment he placed in his soul. And he hadn't made any investments in his soul. And this is where we need to consider ourselves. We need to go, okay, how focused am I on investing in my soul first before I invest in other things. Look at your time that you spend investing in your soul in comparison to other things. That doesn't mean to not have self-responsibility because that's a part of investing in your soul. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a job because that's a part of caring for yourself and investing in your soul. But it does mean that our soul needs to be a primary part of our investment. God, then our soul. And if we can focus on that, we will actually get through the facade if we develop some of these qualities. We'll get through the facade. We'll stop allowing the intellect to influence our choices and decisions and influence how we process through things. And we will get into the real damaged self. And you want to be in the damaged self <laughs> because if you, if you get into the damaged self, you're one step closer to your real self. <laughs> you see? And that's what we want to do. So hopefully that's given you some, uh, I don't know, hopefully some uh, hope for the future in terms of working your way through the facade and getting into the deeper parts of things emotionally and also 
working through some qualities that are essential for your long-term future. Those qualities are all essential for your long-term future now on earth and also in the spirit world. Very essential qualities. Really important to develop. Okay, well tomorrow um, we'll be giving a talk on the subject of spirit life, your sleep state. So that'll be our talk tomorrow. And uh, all welcome to come. I think we've said 10 a.m., haven't we, tomorrow? Yep. So, uh, so that way people who have travelled can travel home afterwards. Um, was there anything else we needed to mention? I think that's about it. We'd like to, myself and Mary would love to thank you for your donations. And we would also like to thank you um, for taking some of the DVDs if you need them. So they're all up the back there. Um, you'll find a long list of them there. I know a lot of you now download them from YouTube or whatever, but think about copies that you might wish to give to others even as well in amongst the process. So, so they're all being produced there um, right up the back. Um, I don't think we have any other announcements that we need to make. No? No. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ivana. Um, in the future, what we're thinking of doing is uh, actually um, doing some, a few sort of music things and stuff like that with, with you in, the, in these presentations. Um, and uh, I don't know, how, how did you guys go cope with me singing down at Kyabra? It, was, <laughs> it, must, it must have been difficult. I was pretty off that day, so... <laughs> um, but uh, what we want to do is uh, do, a, do a little bit more of that with you so, so that you can just feel some joy as well um, rather than just feeling everything's a drag and AJ's talking about a facade again and, <laughs> and tomorrow is going to really upset you, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and so what we'd like, we'd like to um, just... Um, at some point, we want to engage the arts team in this process of, of doing sort of occasional productions for you, uh, and even just short, short ones, you know, like just a song or two here and there. But, but the team's going to have to be out of their addictions and in their real emotions when they do it. So that's something we'll be going through um, as, we, as we talk to the team about that. So that's something to look forward to. And... Um, I don't think there's anything else we need to mention so we'd like to uh, hope you have a good night tonight and uh, for those of you who feel up to it we'll see you tomorrow <laughs> thanks man so we'll catch you tomorrow yeah.